Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 688, our Shazam! Fury of the Gods review. Welcome to Raging Bullets, I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, the master of speculation, the duke of you know, the son of strategy, the bridge defying, is wondering if Sean keeps yelling Shazam outside of his home because he really wants to be a superhero, or is it that he wants to knock out Jim's home electric, but he still remains the elder statesman of the podcast, Segulin. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we're going to be talking about Shazam... Fury of the Gods. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Mr. Seglin, what is going on over at DCBService.com? Well, we got a lot of great stuff. First off, we have Shazam! It didn't work this time. Issue number one, written by Mark Wade, uh, 40%, only two thirty nine. We also have uh, Peacemaker Tries Hard, uh, issue one of six, uh, 40%, only uh, two ninety nine, And we have a really neat thing, uh, Sandman Morpheus Helm box set. So uh, it's the Sandman, the Morpheus Helm, it's holding a box set, leather-bound edition from uh, the Sandman series. Um, it's 45% off, only uh, two seventy five. But it absolutely looks brilliant, and I had to shout this out. I told, funny, Sean and I talked about it off-air yeah. last issue. Last episode, and I'm like, I've got to bring it up this one to let people know about this because this looks really cool. So thank you, DCBS. It does. I hate you because it looks <laughs> it looks really cool, and I'm I'm thinking about it. I really am thinking about it because I love Sandman, and like, I do I need to own it again? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you just said no. No. You meant to say yes. No. You want there's oh there's a yes want. under there's a yes under there absolutely there's a yes I I hear yeah. a yes and yes. at forty five percent you could get two and give one to me <laughs> you know? you're what a bargain <laughs> no, what a bargain. <laughs> you're a hundred you know you are you are right that at that at that price why not yeah. uh, <laughs> over at InStockTrades.com. We have, in the top sellers, we have The Young Animals, Doom Patrol by Gerard Way and Nick Darrington. It's forty nine ninety nine regularly, 42% off, only twenty eight ninety nine. This series is amazing. If you miss this one, do yourself a favor and catch it. We also have Batman, Superman, World's Finest. Hardcover Volume 1, The Devil, Neza. It's twenty four ninety nine regularly, 42% off, only fourteen. Forty-nine. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Mr. Seglin, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, whatnot, a Shazam! Theory of the Gods. So if you haven't watched the movie, 100% go out, watch it now, come back and listen to us. That way you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk this film. Nice work, Adam. What are these characters up to? So, Jim, before we kick into the podcast about the movie itself, I wanted to do a quick little speeding bullets, and this is from the DC Universe Infinite app. So, I was super into Captain Marvel and Shazam and everything because of the movie. You know, I, I was enjoying reading comics and things like that. Last night, I read Captain Marvel Adventures 124. This is from September of 1951, and this is on the DC Universe Infinite app. And I figured, let me start reading through it, and, and if it's my cup of tea, great. If it's dated and all that, that's fun to talk about, too. There is a thing that it's obviously from the 1950s, so there's there's a component to that. But the one I'm going to pick one of the stories and get a little spoilery about it. So if you don't want to hear the spoilers about that, maybe you know skip ahead a few, few a minute or two. But there's this cool little story in there where Captain Marvel, it's Billy Batson, is going to this circus, and in the circus, and he's convinced that you know, like, okay, great, they've got you know these actors that are playing these people from like Don Quixote and people from the past, right? Daniel Boone. Well, it turns out it's this time-traveling circus where this guy from the future has got this time machine and he's going back in time and actually bringing the real people to present-day 1950s. Nice. 
cool, right? I mean, so you're at the circus and this is happening. Well, as you know, it's not going to be that. It's comics, right? So it's not going to be that easy and somebody's a bad guy and all that. <laughs> so the cool part about this is partway through the story, all of a sudden, the the like Don Quixote and Daniel Boone and all of them are escaping into the 1950s world. Well, this is like Bill and Ted's before Bill and Ted's. Because they're reacting to 1950s the way that anyone would from out of time. Like, Daniel Boone at one point in time is, like, trying to save people from a stone lion, which was just a decoration on a building. Yep. But as you guess, if you're using that weapon, it was cool because, like, the bullets were bouncing off the lion and, you know, Captain Marvel had to step in and, you know, capture the bullet. And, you know, he's basically realizing that I can't have these people running around. But the premise also becomes, why are you out of the, like, why aren't you just hanging at the circus? And the reason why this guy's beating them in order to get them to do what he wants them to do. Like, so he's pulled from time, all of these, like, ancient creatures, like a woolly mammoth, all these other things. But he's abusing them. (laughs) It's this time-traveling villain from the future who's doing this to make money. So, I mean, from for 1950s? It was a pretty cool, like, contemporary kind of twisted little story that I'm like, wow, I was very into this. The Captain Marvel Adventures book is an anthology of multiple Captain Marvel stories, but intermixed in there are, like, shorts um, of other different characters. There's even a prose story that's in there. So I, I really wanted to just recommend this real quickly I'm not going to do go into the other stories that are in there other than to say that there are other anthology-like stories. I enjoyed all of them. Right now on the app, there's, it, there's issue 124, 125, 126, 127, and I believe 128 of Captain Marvel Adventures. So it's it's that many issues of the run. I'm going to keep reading them. Like, I read it as a whim, you know, just because I'm Jones and because of the movie I just saw. But I would highly recommend this for anybody that's like, oh, I just got out of the movie. I'd kind of like to see some of the history of these characters. It was really good. So uh, just just a quick recommendation out there of something that maybe you've missed. And if you've got DC Universe Infinite, it's free. And you can plop in and read it right now. So it was, it was really good. It was, it was a nice little... Uh, I intended to read like a story from it and read the whole issue. I, the prose piece was nice and surprising too. There's like a two-page prose story that's in there, which I wasn't expecting. But it's a regular 30-page comic with uh, lots of content. So, good stuff. And that's no ads. I mean, it's 30 pages of pure comic content. So, last night, my wife and I went to go see the movie. And you know you know me, I usually like to do the opening nighters. And I guess I want to talk about how this experience for me was very different than traditionally when I've gone to superhero movies. I'm usually pretty good at beforehand, like if I see reviews or see previews or trailers and all that kind of stuff, walking in like with an open mind and, you know, a genuine excitement. This one was weird for me and I've never had this happen to me before. And I think it's a, it's a really scary sign to me. And I want to talk about this maybe a little bit more as we get to talk organically through. Jim, I walked into this movie with like, I pretty much so knew what I, what I was going to feel. And... That's not a good thing. I walked in assuming that this movie was going to be a good movie, meaning not great, not bad. I was going to talk about how it was an enjoyable experience and how we need movies that are just enjoyable experiences. I walked into the film pretty much knowing in my mind what I was going to say on this podcast episode. I've never done that before. Like, you've heard me on the show where I'm like a diary of the mouth and I'm really excited about something and all that. None of that's pre-planned. It's just genuine reaction. This is the first time I can honestly tell you, and I caught myself, like, after the movie, I was like, oh, my God. I really walked into this film figuring I knew what I was going to be feeling at the end. And I think that's problematic because I think that's also a sign of where things are at right now with how we're being, I guess, movies are being fed to us. You know, information about film is being fed to us. Not just from the people creating the film and the companies, I think in a worse sense from the media outside of it that is directing our thought process. I walked into this one, Jim. I thought it was going to be a good movie. You know, it was our, you know, we were going to have a good conversation around it. I was going to talk about my love for the character, and that was going to be it. What I'm going to say is the movie overtook that <laughs> and then knocked it out of the park because that was not what I expected at all. 
I was glued two hours and 10 minutes. And I, I, dude, I had such a good time at this movie. I was blown away. And I'm glad I, I I will say, I'm glad I walked in with those expectations of, eh, it's going to be a good movie. And like, the film was like, ah, (laughs) dude, we're taking you on a journey and you are going to love every minute of this. And that's what that was for me. Uh, You know, certain things were like, I knew about the Wonder Woman bit and all that kind of thing, because that had been, you know, kind of leaked ahead of time. But Knowing something and seeing the execution are two different things. The way the film handled all that was fantastic. The thing that really is bothering me right now, I have looked at box office numbers. I am I'm incredibly worried that for not just for box office, but because we're heading in this new direction, that we may not get a third movie in this. And that would be a crying shame because all I was left afterwards was wanting more. Two hours and ten minutes afterwards, I was left very satisfied with the film that I just saw. I want the sequel. I want more. I will also say this. I loved Black Adam. I expected Black Adam to be the movie out of the two that I thought was the better movie. This was the better movie for me. I mean, I'm just giving you my thought. I mean, if I'm rating this film over there... I really had so much fun with this. And I love Black Adam, so I want to be very, very clear. You can listen to our podcast episode on Black Adam and get my thoughts on that film. They have not changed. So Black Adam's a film that uh, is near and dear to me and I adore. What I didn't expect, I expected this to be the also movie, not the film where I go, wow, this is a major film in the Shazam franchise. This felt major. It felt very big for me, very exciting. So, I mean, those are my initial impressions. There's so much more. We'll talk about very specific details about the movie and things that we enjoyed along the way. But that's me. Where were you at on this film? Like, what what was your experience? Uh, Tell me about the film. What was my experience? (laughs) Very interesting question. You should ask that. Uh A little spoiler for everybody. I told Sean I have a funny story that I wanted to tell. And I asked him, do you want to know it ahead of time or do you want a live reaction? And we decided to go with the live reaction. So he doesn't know what I'm about to say here. Mm -hmm. So as some of you know, um, I have certain digestive issues. Yeah. I've got, you know, sometimes it's really extreme where I go to the hospital thinking I'm having a heart attack. Other times my tummy aches. Um, so I'm, you know, sitting there and just, you know, had a little bit of popcorn, a little bit of uh, some Coke Zero, and I'm just watching the movie, and I realized, oh, God, we have a problem. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> and then I quickly realized that it's a problem, not uh, a lower exit, but an upper exit. Oh, no. So I get out of my seat, run to the bathroom, as well as much as I run, you know, get to the bathroom, get to the toilet just in time to just vomit. And I'm just blah, unleashing, unleashing, you know, unholiness into that toilet. Um, you know, rinse my mouth out, and I'm like, okay, I'm going back in. <laughs> <laughs> now that's wait, that is fan dedication. It's like, dude, I'm good. I'm back in the. Movie. I'm going back in. Yeah, well, I, I kind of figured it wasn't an illness, but no. it was just you know my just me Mm -hmm. you know some of the stuff that happened so there's a section of the movie that i missed okay but you know i'll be honest with up until that point in the movie i was enjoying the movie so much like i gotta see the ending yeah i gotta see this ending so i had to go back (laughs) for it so that's how much i enjoyed the movie um is that i threw up in the middle of it Mm -hmm. and i had to go back and see the ending of it which you know watching the second half of the movie with that it's not matter how much you rinse your mouth out you're gonna have that Mm -hmm. taste still in your mouth so i I enjoyed the rest of the movie even though i kind of had that taste you know (laughs) so is this the first movie that you've enjoyed that left a bad taste in your mouth or i mean like i'm just saying (laughs) oh yeah but well, I guess you did enjoy the movie, right? Oh, big time. <laughs> you know, and it was funny. A lot of the stuff you just said, mm-hmm. I'm, I was going to echo 100%. Because going into this movie, I, like you, I was practicing what I was going to say in the car, by the way. Yeah. Going yeah. to the movie theater, I already practiced what I was going to say. You know, so, and it was one of those things where I'm like, ah, eh, it's going to be a good movie, but it's going to, it's, you know, I, 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 you know, I was like, ah, you know, I, cause I enjoyed Shazam. It was a fun movie, but it wasn't like epic. 
You know, this one actually supersedes the first movie to me. I enjoyed this one more than the, the first movie. This, and it, it's it's completely shocks me to say this, but I enjoyed this more than I enjoyed uh, Black Adam. You know, and you know me and The Rock. You know, he's my guy. And I love that movie. This movie I enjoyed more. You know, even with the whole sec, uh, a small section that I missed, you know, it still had some great moments in there. It had some great just, you know, character development. And it was weird for me because when I was walking out of the movie theater, mm -hmm. I wasn't excited. And the reason I wasn't excited was because going through my head, I'm like, this is it. There's not going to be another movie. They're not going to continue these characters. They're not going to continue these threads. And I was a little bit on the, I was a little down. Me too. And, and I remember back um, when Batman 2 came out, Michael Keaton Batman 2, mm -hmm. you know, came out. I had a very similar reaction where I was like, ah, I was down. And the reason I was down was because I had a lot of uh, personal stuff going on, you know, at that time that movie came out. And that actually took my enjoyment of the movie away. And I remember having a conversation with my mom about it. Because she was like, yeah, the movie? I was like, eh. It's like, what? And I just, you know, and as I'm talking to her, telling her about the movie, I was, I obviously enjoyed the movie, but it was just everything. I was like, you know, don't let this other stuff weigh you down. If you like that, enjoy the movie. I'm like, hey, it was a good movie. And then by the time I got done talking with mom, I was like, you know, this is a, this is a fun movie. I enjoyed it. I was glad they did it. And I, I actually enjoyed the experience more because of that conversation with mom. So as I'm in the car, leaving the movie theater, I was having that same conversation with my mom again, you know, about this movie. And I started just talking about the different cool stuff that happened, laughing, going, oh, my God, John and I are going to have a ball with the puke yeah. story. That's just going to be awesome for the podcast. And then just as I'm talking more about it, and I'm literally as I'm driving home, talking in the car to mom about the movie, and that's when I realized how much I really enjoyed this movie yeah. and how much, you know, both um, Shazam version and Billy Batson version, the the Freddy and uh, Captain uh, Every Power yes. know, bits were absolutely wonderful. You know, and to the point when I got home, I started looking up the actors. You know, seeing hey, what else has this kid done? Because he's really good. I you know, he's coming to Cleveland, right? He's going to be yeah. here next weekend. Yeah. You know, and all, but also uh, Jack Dylan uh, Grazer, who plays uh, Freddie Freeman. I really like that kid. That's who I mean. I thought he did an outstanding job. That's who I mean. He's coming to Cleveland next weekend. I thought uh, Billy was coming. Um, z no, no. Um, Zachary Levi, Captain yeah. Marvel's coming. Well, Shazam's coming. Shazam's coming. And um, the kid who played Freddie Freeman. Oh, okay. I thought uh, Billy Batson was coming. No. And Asher Angel. Yeah. No, no, no. That's um, that, that's why I was bringing it up because I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the kid, believe me, I'm a big Adam Brody fan, so you've got me at Adam Brody being in yeah. it. And I think he does a great job of being the adult. Ver That's hard to do, where you're an adult who is trying to play that you are the kid. And yes. and I think they've done, a, the, the actors, all of the actors have really done a good job of maintaining the sense of personality that you get when they're the kid. And vice versa. I mean, I think yes. it, that is something, the casting of this and the pairing of actor acting talent throughout this Darla I mean you could say it for the uh, Mary the entire crew Pedro Eugene they and for me to be rattling off the names like that of the characters it's because of the fact that I just really throughout this film I, I think the advantage this one had over the first film the first film was an origin story of not just Billy but the entire family and you need that you needed that for this film. You needed all of that to be established and set. What I did not expect from this one is exactly what you're saying, that I liked this one more. I figured the first one was going to be the one where I was like, oh, this is the this is the statement. This is the one. I walked into this one expecting to say, it was a good sequel. I want a third. You know, meaning that I really enjoyed myself. It was a good time. I'm going to own it. It'll be a rewatch. My preference will be the first one. I, I knew exactly how I was going to feel about this thing. And the movie said something else. <laughs> oh, big time. And I, lo I loved that part of this. And it's funny, keeping with the, the thing you said about how the younger actors and the older actors each doing a great job pairing. Yeah, hundred percent agree with you. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, Adam Brody and uh, you know Jack uh, Dylan Grazer did a brilliant job of each playing oh, yeah. off of each other. But Megan Good is the one who stole it for me because her portrayal of Darla, 
of superhero Darla yep. was just so perfect. And in the first movie, she was also that same kind of, you know, it was oh, it was really cool seeing her because she really gets the, she plays the youngest of them, so she really gets to have the, the most goofy kiddy, kidness in her. But it was just absolutely wonderful when she was doing that stuff because I've seen her in a couple other uh, movies and she never played this sweet little innocent kid in the other movies. So seeing her do that was really awesome. But I like the fact that the the younger actors Faith, really Faith, got to wait. flesh some muscle can in we, this movie. Can well. we please talk about Faith Herman? And I, yes. I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing oh. her because there's an E at the end. I want to make sure. I hope I'm getting it right. But if, if I'm getting her name wrong, I yes. adamantly oh, want God. to apologize because you need both. So every yes, I'm nodding with everything you're saying. And I'm not trying to derail where you're going. I just don't want to move away from that particular pairing because Taste the Rainbow and that whole unicorn Skittles thing. My wife and I were like high-fiving during that. Yes. And, Normally... I am anti obvious, you know, placement, advertising placement in a movie. Normally that takes me away from it. That was so perfect usage of it, especially because they laid down the pipe work. You know, they laid down the groundwork early with her and Mm -hmm. the candy and then even her taking uh, candy to Hespera when they had her captured and this and that. And they they perfectly, and and I was sitting there, I was just like, oh my God, I, I saw it coming. You know, you, you see it I'm like, oh, this is, yes, yes. And I cheered at that moment. I, I, that was, again, another, again, those two worked well together as you've being been, the older and younger version. You've been evil, so you only get the yellows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, that stuff was great. And that's, I think, what was so great about this film was the fact that there is a serious story here, like with a lot of depth and a lot of character development for a lot of, I mean, there's a lot going on in this film, but what they also sprinkled in there and, and it's trying to find that balance of there, Shazam's got to be fun. I mean, there's got to be a fun factor to this. It's really important, but you don't want to make it so fun that it's so campy that you no longer believe in this as a film. Like, uh, like, you 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 got to believe there's danger to the hero. You've got to believe and care. This reminded me a lot of um, what I like about some of the Chaplin films. I know it's kind of a weird maybe reference to throw in there, but you've got you know Chaplin playing you know these little slapstick bits and things like that. But if you watch those films, there's usually a heartwarming and endearing story that's going on there that makes you really care about the character, and it's because you laughed with the character. And you smiled with the character. You, you're you protective of the character. I was that way with this and Billy and Shazam and the whole family. Like every t- like when they were taking powers away left and right, Lucy Liu's character, Calypso, was taking powers away from left and right. I was really, really, while there's that part of me that's like, they're not going to kill them. The disbelief was so strong during all of it and everything was happening so fast. I didn't have the chance to necessarily focus on that, I was focused on the journey. I felt danger. I felt like I was protective. I felt like I was running along with them. I loved that I felt better when they were together as a family, even depowered. Like, you felt like when they got together, like, they're going to figure it out. Like, they're going to do something. They're going to make this work, even though it seems like this overwhelming odds. And I thought that was something that was cool in the writing. Like, when they were split up into little subgroups... I felt like they were more in trouble than when they were together. And not saying that there wasn't danger when they were together as a group, but I felt like, all right, they're together now. They're going to start figuring this out. They're going to start taking steps to do something together. Um, it's going to be, you know, Team team Batson family, whatever you want to call it, and they're going to make this happen. And that was something that, like, I really felt was well done in the scripting and in the acting and uh, just in the way it just played out because you know sometimes you can have the best script in the world and the scene sometimes you know the editing something goes wrong and you lose that feeling something was just missed it was the wrong take or something like that i never felt that in this film it moved at a really good pace the relationships were being developed i also liked that it didn't feel like this massive time jump from the first film there's some time movement and there's some progression of course But these are also still kids who, at the end of the last movie, for the entire family, 
including Billy still, who was very new to his powers, this superhero gig is a new thing. And I like that this movie, the premise of it was, they're not getting it right because <laughs> there's no training manual to any of this. You're trying to figure it out, and you're figuring it out based on media and comic books and stories and books and things that you've read that are fiction, right? And 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 encyclopedias and manuals that go, and you and I both know, you're a D D and D player and stuff like that. All of these things, D, DC even has who's who archives, right, where you can like delve into like the back, like the rules and everything, right? These, these things all have that, and and between the family and their varied interests, they have those rules, and they're trying to use them productively to try and figure this all out because what's not manifesting itself right now is the wisdom of Solomon. <laughs> and I loved that presence in this whole thing that that isn't that hasn't clicked yet. Like they they aren't tapping into that. It was really really strong with that. I liked this sense of getting to know as heroes they're and yet they're not giving up. Right? Because they're being if you look at the media, they're being trashed. I mean, the names that they're being given, yeah. you know, they're a flop and a disaster like beforehand. And once you get that way, we know as a society, it's really hard to pull yourself out. <laughs> yeah. Once you once you get that negative connotation next to your name, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. Yeah. You know, um, radio show I used to listen to, Opie and Anthony, mm -hmm. you know, they one time said on air, we could cure cancer. And people would still call us the shock jocks. Yeah, you yeah. know, it, it does not matter just because of everything they've done. You know, they did on the radio. They were locked in. And even to this day, there is no Opie and Anthony. And they're still, you know, marked with uh, marked with that uh, negative connotation. So it's kind of funny that, you know, you think and look. And again, is one of the realist, realistic things about this movie that I really enjoyed was, again, the media portrayal. The fact that these kids don't really know what they're doing. I remember back when The Matrix first came out, you know, and they have that, that test where you jump, the, the jump test, and everyone's like, you know, everyone misses it on their first time. I remember I was in a comic shop and people were talking about it, and I heard somebody, and I had no idea who it was, say, if you get any comic book fan, we'd make the jump on the first try because we know it's possible. And I, you know, and I laughed, and we all laughed about it at that moment, but then you get thinking back to this, you know, this movie, if a comic book hero, like if you or I got the powers of Shazam, we would do things a little differently. But, you know, you've got Freddy, who's the diehard comic book guy, but he's still immature. You know, you've got you know, Billy, who's got a good heart to him, and he just... He doesn't know what he's doing, you know. You got Mary, who's the intelligent. Mary is the intelligent one of the group, you know. And but she's holding multiple directions. I I loved how you know you can see some of these as heroes. They're playing up. They're trying to do it, like um, the bridge scene. You know, they did a great job saving everybody. But when it came time to fixing the bridge, uh, not so well. <laughs> but you know, there was moments they were trying. I loved and. Um, it was Pedro, I think, who is, or it was Pedro or Eugene. I can't remember who it was, but they were trying to weld the the, the broken strands together, you know, using the elect, using the lightning to weld the broken strands together, and it didn't hold because, well, they didn't weld it correctly, or it, or maybe, you know, technically, I don't even know if that's really even possible if something that's only done in comic books if it really can't work. I don't know, but I liked how they're trying, but they're just. Not there yet. <laughs> yeah. A piece I actually would be remiss if I didn't shout out was um, Michael Gray, who played Billy Batson on the 70s TV series. Yes, was that in was it. awesome. And and I caught it immediately. And I'm not the only one. I mean, that's, you know, anybody who watched that. But, I mean, I caught immediately that it was him. I mean, like, when I looked at him, I mean, it's like 50 years later. Yeah. And because that show aired from 74 to 76. And it's funny, on the show, I often reference that um, the 60s Batman show was like my gateway and, and the 60s Spider-Man cartoon, you know, the old Spider-Man, Spider-Man. That was, you know, those were my initial exposures to comics. I don't give credit enough for the Shaz to the Shazam TV show because I was three years old when that thing aired. Three, four, and five. 
dude, I was out in my backyard running around with a towel around me going, Shazam! And, you know, playing Shazam. I mean, you're a three-year-old kid. That show had an incredible impact. You know, him and Mentor riding around that Winnebago and, like, saving people and the morals at the end. Um, it was it was a show. Because, you know, at the end of the show, what you got is Captain Marvel stopping off. And he's talking to kids. And he's talking to you, you know, I mean, in the way that he's doing it. As a kid, that show had an amazing impact. When he came on the screen, I felt like a kid again. I mean, the movie was already doing that to me because of the fun factor. But then you saw him in there, and I loved the way they handled him with the cameo, with the shirt on from the show. Yep. I mean, it was it was. I am so glad that they acknowledged him and had him in there. Uh, it was it was a geek out as a fan, um, especially so many years later. And boy, the fact that God love you him called him Captain Marvel. I, that was the thing that I did. Yes. He's like, go get him, Captain Marvel. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. That was so cool. So cool. So, uh, yeah, and I give, him, I give him credit for really acknowledging the, the that show. You know, what's really important on a show, on a movie like this, too, is villains. The villains that you have. And the fact that they were complicated. The fact that there were the three sisters. I, I'll tell you one piece I didn't see coming, and I should have. When they first introduced Anne, <laughs> I'm like, they're doing a good job of introducing like a girlfriend for Freddy. I will admit they swerved me. You, you got to, you started to see the writing in the wall at a certain point in time, but it certainly wasn't at the school. When they, st- obviously, when they announced that there were three sisters, I'm like, oh no, <laughs> you know, my head went right away to where it was. She was fantastic. Um, Rachel Zegler um, was the actress who played her. She was fantastic because you had to, before that reveal happened, you had to care about her. When the twist comes, it's a twist of a knife, but you still have to like her enough that you're there's doubt, right? So that part was really important to me. Lucy Liu as Calypso was terrific. And the way that they played her and Helen Mirren as Hespera in the beginning was really important because she went to reach for the staff first and Helen Mirren slapped her hand and that stuck with me. And it was funny how later on when the turn came, you kind of saw the roots of it earlier on that, you know, power, obviously there's that thirst for power, that quest for power, and that idea that maybe one is better able to handle the power than the other. Maybe one has ideas on how the power should be handled over the other. And I thought this film did a really great job of doing that. They're trying to resurrect their society, and they have very different ideas on how to do it. And I love that how of this vision of this beautiful thing, the resurrection of a society, can be tarnished by a change in vision. Because this idea was they were going to resurrect the society where it originally was. And then the decision of, well, we'll just wipe out this place because they deserve it. Uh, it twisted everything and you saw the twisting not only in the actions of the people meaning you know particularly Lucy Liu but also in the tree and every I really loved how that you can your the way you use magic decides how that magic manifests and I thought that was pretty deep in all of this too I mean this movie had a lot of depth to it oh god yeah and I'll tell you Lucy Liu Helen Mirren Rachel uh, Zegler Absolutely wonderful casting. Again, mm-hmm. this movie did, ca- and, and of course the wizard, I mean, he's awesome. But this did a great job with your villains, you know. And you kind of do air quotes around the term villain because you kind of understand what they're coming from. As you said, their society was dead, and when they had that great moment between Helen, uh, well, between Hespera and uh, Shazam, and they're talking just about someone breaks into your house and steals your coins, you're going to want them back. But as they're leaving, they drop them, and their neighbor picks up the coins. You're going to go after the neighbor for those coins, as well as the person who initially stole them. I I loved that. You know, again, the casting they did, they got two high-quality actresses to play these roles. You know, and again, they got a great actress to play Anne. And they did a brilliant job with just, you know, putting in people who can actually act in a superhero movie. And I thought that is something that really makes it 
you know, something that took it to another level of beyond. And that's something I'm really enjoying that superhero movies don't have the stigma that they used to have that they're oh, it's, it's just a superhero movie. No, this is an actual movie. The main characters happen to be superheroes. You happen to be playing, uh, you know, the daughters, you know, and you know you happen to be playing gods. Okay, it's not exactly re- grounded in reality, but it's still real. It's still actual physical emotions. Just the pure rawness of the, you know, just that energy that they brought to it was absolutely brilliant. And it was something that, again, quality acting, you know, quality actors can bring to any role. You know, the old line, there is no small parts, you know. Right here, you're seeing it. This is not just a superhero movie villain. This is showing that, hey, I'm an actual actress. I can actually do this. And anything Helen Mirren's in, I'm going to always see because she's awesome. And Lucy Liu, same thing. But the Anne, for me, did a brilliant job. You know, and again, it's these young actors, young actresses who are really – they're stepping up and you're because normally kid actors or younger actors aren't that good, you know, you know, or in the past haven't been there. This okay. They're a pretty face, throw them on camera. They'll read their lines. Good to go. These, these kids were really bringing some raw emotion and getting pulling this tugging at the heartstrings. I loved, you know, when they first introduced her, I honestly thought she's the bad guy. You know, just because of my knowledge on superhero movies, I'm like, I don't think they're just introducing a girlfriend, you know, and then as she started getting interested in, you know, Freddie knowing the superheroes, like, oh, my God. Then it, what I actually thought, I thought it was Calypso in disguise. I thought it was Lucy Liu's character. And we we're going to get a moment when she morphs into Lucy Liu and you're like, oh, you know, and that's what I was actually thinking. And then, of course, when they said the three sisters, I'm like, oh, there's Anne. No, no. <laughs> which made it far more, which made it far more interesting. Oh, big time. I, I, again, I love this over what I initially thought. It, I initially, again, I initially thought it was going to be Lucy Liu. And, you know, the, when the reveal came, that would just, it, it would just be even worse, you know, even worse tug on Freddie's heart. But the fact that it was the third sister, the fact that they had a legit connection was absolutely wonderful. And I love the, the premise throughout this has always been powers don't make a superhero. You know, and, you know, you know, Anne says it to Freddie. Freddie says it back to her later on. It's, you know, it, it's a great idea that everybody can step up. Everyone can be that hero. You know, and that's, again, you, you talk about with the uh, the old TV show with Shazam talking to kids about morals and this and that. That right there is a huge moral, you know, code that can be taken out of this movie that you don't need to have the powers of Shazam to do something in your area. You don't need to have that to step up and do the right thing. And the fact that the, you know, the Shazam family didn't have their powers for a large chunk of it, and they were still acting as heroes. They were still stepping up, you know, Victor and Rosa stepped up once they learned the secret, you know, and they're, you know, they're doing their part on, you know, what the family needs, you know, the battle wagon, you know, it, it's, it was some really cool moments. Again, some great family moments, some great hero moments, but it's not even necessarily the heroes in the cost moments. And I think that is something that really hit home on this movie. Well, I like the idea that in and out of the costume, you're the hero. And then out of the costume, you're the villain. You know, in the case of the people that <laughs> that were villains, yeah. the the interesting part was this whole premise of theirs of resurrecting their society. At no point in time do you sit there and go, "Well, that's wrong." It wasn't that the concept. There's a beauty to what they were trying to do, right? Yep. It's just the how is where things got twisted. They lost their way. Trying to supplant a world in order to do that is not the pathway. And I really liked that there was that distinction between the way to do it. And there's two points in time where you you see the tree grow in our world with what they're trying to do and how twisted it looked. But then you see it at the end of the film. And I I don't mean to jump around, but you kind of got to talk about the comparisons of the beauty. It was a very beautiful tree, you know, very beautiful sequence and grew even more beautiful with the appearance. I'm just going to go to it with the appearance of Diana when she came and the magic started interacting and you saw the beauty and you saw the it manifest in with good intention. Right. It's proof that you can pervert magic. And I really and you can pervert anything, really. And I really enjoyed that. I liked Anne's journey in particular because she never at any point in time gives up that the idea of resurrecting her people itself is wrong. 
it's what they were going to do that was wrong, how it was right. going to destroy this world and destroy these people, especially after she built this relationship with Freddie where she's like, this is a good person. And it's not about his powers. It's about who he is as a person, that he's willing to step up, be this person, be this help, be this kindness. When he's really, he's got some physical issues, you know, but yet he's still willing to not compromise. He's not willing to compromise himself. Um, he knows who he is and he's trying to navigate this world, even though the world keeps beating him down. And I really liked seeing that. I mean, that was just as important to me as seeing him as a hero. And, you know, I'm sorry, seeing him with superpowers, because really, I think we see him in a strange way, more as a hero when he's without the powers. And I love that aspect of it. And that's not knocking anything that Adam Brody did. I think Adam Brody played the role really well because it's important for Adam Brody to play it the way he did in order to further broadcast who he is out of um, when he's not when he hasn't said Shazam. So the interplay between the two was dynamic, necessary, and it further added to what was going on. And that says a lot about how Adam played his portion of it. Um, that it it fed it fed that, and it's funny because like with Adam and Jack versus Zachary and Asher, how each one's playing it. I think mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Jack uh, Freddie set more of the pace than Adam did. I think it's to me it seems like Adam was following more of Freddie's lead on how the character was. And I think that is really cool. Whereas with uh, you know with Zach and Asher, it it was. Um, I, I, they each had their own different groove and style going on. You know, you really, again, and, it, and I don't want to knock that because they had a great, they, it, it was great casting. The two of them, you really could see, yes, that's him. You could very easily see that comparison as being the same thing. But to me, it seems more like the Freddy role had the bigger driving factor. And I like that. Because the younger one should be a heavier driver. Kind of like one of the reasons I like Super Darla and Darla so much is because the younger was such a driving factor in how the uh, the super version played the character. You know, and with, you know, Freddy, you really see that, again, a lot of, like, just the mannerisms kind of, you know, kid crossed over. So the mannerisms that Freddy was doing, Super Freddy was still doing. As Adam, I thought that for me was a really cool usage. Again, great acting on Adam Brody's part, you know. And Adam Brody, Megan Good, I think, did brilliant jobs on capturing the essence of the younger version. All of them did, so I'm not knocking anybody, but those two were the two that really just stood out to me on how much they parried, you know, their younger versions. It says a lot about the confidence of an actor, though when they are able to facilitate and enhance the performances of the younger talent that they're working with. I, I think that energy between both, all of them worked really well because there's nobody that I thought was awkward when they did it. You don't get to see as much with Eugene and Pedro, but you see it. And, yeah. and what you see with them has to be really good because it, it's quick. Right. Because there's only so much screen time that you have so many opportunities. And I thought when they did utilize those characters and showed them in both adult and kid form and what was going on, because they were trying to enhance their stories, too. And I thought they did a good job of it because you can't focus on everybody all the time because it's a two hour movie. But I really did feel like everybody had some progression, even if it was a lesser progression. And that was the, the use of screen time for those characters in particular. Um, I thought that they did a really good job because they didn't have as much opportunity. Um, you got to get it right. I, I don't feel like that there was anybody that I didn't at the, the end of this film know more than I did from the first film. Like I got this family unit a lot more and it wasn't just one or two characters. It was the whole family. And I think that was something at the end that was really pivotal to me. That when um, Billy has, the, you know, the moment in the beginning that really plays off of what came in the first film. Billy was just getting used to this idea of, okay, I guess I'll stick around here. And yeah. I'll put my hand in and be a part of the team. In this film, it was really more of this idea of fear. He started loving these people, started caring about these people, but he was afraid of losing them like everybody else. 
and what he needed from them. First of all, he needed to acknowledge his own fears so that way they could react to it instead of maybe going to the pediatrician, <laughs> which I thought was so awesome. Um, but he needed to be able to eventually get to that point where he was vocalizing what his worries were. And it was he was taking over for the team. He's like sitting here saying, you know, when, when this is over and I come back, I'll, you know, I know I'm aging out and I'm going to be 18. And I love when she just looks at him and goes, you're my son. Like, you don't age out of that. You know, <laughs> it's one of those things. And he just needed that. He needed that from her to let go of that wall that he was putting up that was keeping him from being able to call her mom. Yeah. And recognizing that this woman is raising me, this woman loves me, and I love this woman. And I, that moment was like so cool because of the way that it played out in the film. When that emotionally means something to you, and you're like, wow, I really care about this family, it doesn't take anything away from the dad, but the, you know, it really was that mom and son relationship. And that's the thing that I loved about the casting of both mom and dad in this is that they both, throughout the film, have this partnership that you can tell and you believe in their relationship. So, and and you believe that they're... I love that the dad's the one that, like, is watching it on the TV and going, wait a minute. Yeah. He's asking the question in his yeah. head, and they happen to walk in the door at the right time that he's like, ah, it couldn't be them. You know what I mean? Uh, but you know it's in the back of his head that he would have... I think he would have figured it out on his own. Yes, um, I think so too. If we got there. And I really liked seeing that play out because if you're living in that environment and you're and and that's happening around you, clues are going to drop and, and or questions are going to be in your head as far as why are they not here? Why are they all leaving together? It's weird the way that they just walk out. And I like that it led to some intelligent kind of questions being asked. Hey, and even the mannerisms, catching the mannerisms of the heroes and saying, oh, kind of familiar. I loved that part of the film. The parents were really, really a terrific part of this. And I think that was a movement forward from the first film as well. Their development, I think, um, whereas they were a necessary vehicle in the first film, I thought they became characters that mattered so much more in the second film, which it should happen. This is, should be the progression you're getting with them. And one of the things that's funny, I liked, I like that with Mary this time, the same actress was playing Mary and super Mary. You know, they didn't go with a separate actress because the actress, you know, is actually old enough that she could play the older version. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, but you still, it, I, initially when I saw super Mary, I was like, wait, that it, I did have to do a double take. It took me a, mi- a little bit to realize, oh, wow, they're doing the same actress for her, not everybody else. And, you know, and it, it did take me a little bit to catch that. So Was she you know, Super Mary in both? No. The first movie, they had a different actress playing Super Mary. Okay. You know, this is the only one where she's playing Super Mary. So I was like, that was kind of cool that you know how they did it. But also, she does look different as Super Mary. Yeah. Than she did as you know as her regular real Mary. It's the whole Clark Kent and glasses thing. Could that really confuse anybody? Well, it's not just the glasses. It's the fact that that's Mary. You wouldn't think Mary's flying is a superhero flying all over the place. But you wouldn't think that. So I was like, so I liked how they were able to pull it off with that. And part of me, and again, this is going to anger a lot of people. What I'm about to say, and I know it would never actually happen, but part of me would like to see Billy and Mary both, because now they're both 18, take on their parents' last names and go through the process saying, no, I'm no longer Billy Batson. I'm no longer Mary Bromfield. I am Billy Vasquez and actually take on his parents' name, you know, and because when you're 18, you can legally change your name. You know, and actually go through. I think that would be a really cool thing. Granted, they'll never happen. And I'm, as I said, I'm probably angering some classic fans of the Shazam and Captain Marvel units. I know he's Billy Batson. He's always got to be. I get it. I get it. But part of me would like to. That would be a neat modern twist. I would like to see on the story, and that would be something for me. The beginning of the third movie, you see Billy and Mary in court taking on the names of the Vasquezes because this is our family. We're old enough now we can change our name. We're changing it to the people that, you know, who actually, you know, have taken care of us. 
you know, and I think that would be a, for me that would be a really cool thing, you know, a continuing story in the mar in the movie universe. I'm not against it. It would be like, what's the storytelling reason for that? Like that that has to be a part of a film, uh, and I'm not. Well, that's what I'm thinking. The I'm not, opening credits of the third movie, the opening segment uh-huh. is them in courtroom, them doing that. You know, so that's that's going to be that's going to be your movie. That's going to be your movie opener. Yeah. Like nothing, like and then right action, after, action, right or, after, or like then draw right you into the court. film. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Okay. So the, it opens in court, you know, and you're like, "What the heck, a courtroom? What's going on here?" And then you're like, "Then there's there, and oh, okay, there's the name." And then as they're walking out of court, like mom, dad, you know, hug, 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 ah, explosion in the background. They're like, "Go get them, kids," you know, and that's that's then you open into a, a battle or a rescue or some type of thing where the Shazam family is uh, flying into into the. Uh, into the fight and that's then you open with that action but you you start off with that little brief thing there i think you know again for me i think that would be a cool bit i don't i don't dislike the bit but your placement of it is i think where i'm where it's falling apart for me end credits you know like if the if if the movie like if the if the, if the third movie had like an end credits scene and they did something like that that would fit a lot more for me like i don't no, no, I, I got it okay hold on i just got it they're on their way to the courthouse to do it. Uh-huh. Something happens. I'm like, oh, we got to reschedule. We gotta, oh, and later, oh, we got to reschedule. You got to reschedule. And then you go through the entire movie where they don't do it. Then the end credit scene is them actually doing it. Sure. I like that way better. So that's going to be the third movie <laughs> that I'm making in my head because I, I think I think here's the, here's where it's here's where it's falling apart for me. We're trying to build the third movie around this courthouse scene that you've got to force in there, <laughs> and I just I'm not seeing it. Here's I, I, I want to here's what I want to know. Like I'm far more interested in Savannah and Mr. Mind and where that's going. <laughs> like in the monster, if they're doing the Monster Society of Evil, whatever they're doing, I don't know what they're what the plan is for the third. But like you got to give me that first before we're getting that. I I don't dislike what you're saying. I'm just not building a film around it. <laughs> Because I, I think the idea, because here's the thing, you care about the family, and it really is, it's Victor and Rosa, who are played by Cooper Andrews and Marta Milans, and I, I was looking it up because I kept calling them mom and dad, which, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I didn't want to not acknowledge, because I, the, honestly, the the actors that are playing those two characters do such an incredible job that um, I really, especially in this film, I grew to care about them even more. And it's where you're going with this, like, why you want Billy and Mary to, like, acknowledge that they're part of the family. I get it. And I I would like to see more development of the family, whether they take the last name or not. It's the emotion, the fact that uh, there's that genuine caring. And they they have to, in the third film, progress the family even more, whatever that looks like. If it is, you know, what you're going for or something else. What there needs to be is continued progression for this family. That's why I desperately want, desperately want a uh, third movie um, yes, because I want to see more with them. And unfortunately, I don't think we'll get it. I don't either. I don't think we'll get it. And that, that is something that does upset me. And, you know, this universe could continue on, you know, and I would love to see it. Here's what I'm really getting tired of hearing. The phrase, and I've referenced this on previous episodes, superhero burnout. That's nonsense. That's yeah. like saying that's comedy film burnout, horror film burnout, sci-fi film burnout. There's times where we've gotten, in all the genres I just mentioned, you've gotten you know films that have been knockout, breakout hits, and you've had other ones that are like popcorn flick that some people really like, other people didn't bother seeing, um, there wasn't the interest or the buzz. That doesn't mean that like you don't make another comedy film. You don't make another horror movie. Like how many B movie horror duds have there been out there? But yet, if you are a diehard horror fan, like we're diehard superhero fans, there's going to be films like that that are really more of a niche audience film than the general public, right? But then there's other movies. Let's use like a Hangover as an example. The first Hangover movie got an immense amount of buzz and just a, a, a overwhelming amount of people went to go see that film, right? And there's there's comedy films you can reference that are like that. Avatar, great example of a film where it did gangbusters at the box office. It's drawing in people that aren't your traditional sci-fi movie fans, right? Because of the spectacle, because of the buzz around it and that type of thing. They aren't necessarily going to go out and see... 
the expanse watch the expanse on television or something like that i'm you know maybe not a great example but i mean you know what i'm talking about you're no, not, you're, you. not, you're not going to go die hard into that the superhero burnout thing is nonsense yes um what's going to happen is because there's so many of those movies out there people are just going to like mosey around other things i do think we are as a society right now incredibly driven by the buzz leading up to a film a lot more than the film itself. I was, I totally went into this film with a lot of baggage. And it's one of the first times I can really remember, a, and I'll specifically reference when we were going to talk about a film on the show, that I walked in pretty much so knowing in my head what I was going to say, and I'm not saying any of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I walked in with some real preconceived notions on what I was going to see. And that, for me, was a very different experience. I'm not like that with film. I usually walk in. I love film. I walk in. If anything, where my bias is, I love film. I go in very open-minded that I'm going to probably enjoy myself. Um, I know what, I, what I'm interested in. I know what I'm not. And I see quite a bit. I don't see every film. Because not every film is for me, but I like a lot of different genres. I really enjoy the whole film experience. And usually, most films that I want to go see, I'll come out and say, at the very least, I enjoyed the experience of seeing it at the theater. This is the first one where I feel like I walked in thinking that was what I was going to get. Yeah. And being blown away. Yeah. Big time. Uh, Again, it's... This is a movie that, you know, I, one, I much enjoyed, I enjoyed more than the first movie. Mm-hmm. 100%, I can say, clearly say that. And I enjoyed the first movie. So I don't want anyone thinking, oh, Jim didn't like, no, I liked the first movie. You know, this one to me was a lot better. You know, and again, it had, it, there was some really just tug at the heartstrings moments. There was some funny moments. There was just as as I if we talked multiple times already about just some of the, the the superhero versions of them playing these younger kids, but they didn't do it so over the top that it's like oh come on no it was absolutely wonderful you know again Megan Good just her portrayal of Super Darla I one hundred percent always got it she always gave me a chuckle always and it was never anything inappropriate never anything that you know, took away from the story or anything like that. I was like, this is right where I should be laughing, right at the moment I should be having fun, you know, and I should be enjoying this, these parts. And it's, again, it's that brilliant balance of putting in comedic moments when, you know, it doesn't take away from the action. And again, the uses of the soundtrack at different times was again another spot on one. the The opening scene when they're fixed, when the there's the the bridge, the George Washington Bridge is correct collapsing, and they're going in there, and he catches the car just as I need a hero is playing. And I'm like, oh, that is awesome. And then he comments, oh, don't tell me I just caught this when this song is playing. Oh, that is perfect. I'm like, yes. I get cheered, laughed right in those moments. It was absolutely brilliant usage. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was something that was great. You mentioned earlier the bridge, and I'd be remiss if I didn't go back and talk about the bridge sequence just a little bit further, because it, I think it it ties into what I really loved about the the ending battle with the, these pods, right? Because you had this tree that was ripping up the city, right, right, in Philadelphia, and and you got to see, you know, just what that was that was bad enough, right? But then these pods start going up, and this idea. When you've got this many heroes, right, as part of the family, you really need to have this sense of how can they possibly overcome this? And these heroes are having their powers taken away, like, on the fly. Like, not only do they have to fight what's going on on the street, but they also have to deal with the fact that they have to play dodgeball (laughs) with the staff. And I really liked that premise of how do you do that when you've got all of this other stuff going on. These pods are opening up and you've got these horrific creatures that are throwing them around. It was really, really awesome. And you got to see the fact that people were, you know, I mean, there was real danger to people, you know, and, and uh, bystanders that were going on. So you get kind of the idea why 
you know, okay, you know, when these heroes are coming on the scene, both with the bridge and the whole sequence, people are getting hurt. Their cars are getting destroyed. Their livelihood, you know, so they're coming on the scene and, and the they're in a world with Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman where people are kind of like, hey, it's great that you're rolling on that costume at all, but, um, you know, the end result for me was... Either I lost a family member, I lost a car, I lost my house, I lost uh, the place that I work. This is not a good thing that, uh, you know, you, you guys have done certain things that are good, but maybe throwing him into three vehicles wasn't the way to go. And I, I really liked that sense of, like, reality to this, if that makes sense. How they're trying to do the best they can and they are doing good work, but the end result isn't going to be always so clean, but yet you got to keep going on. You got to keep persevering. There was that sequence with Freddie and Anne with the dragon where the dragon was breathing on them, you know, and, and using its power. And Lucy Liu was in shock. Calypso was in shock because Freddie kept pressing on and it was sheer will. It was sheer determination to do what was right where you see Freddie's a hero. You know, in there, and and there, you know, he references that he and Billy were partners, and and those pieces, they're the deep emotional piece. It's because at Freddie's core, that's who Freddie is, and I really loved the portrayal of Freddie in this, as he kept making his way forward, and it's one of the reasons why I do give a nod also to Adam Brody because I think you're giving as an actor when you feed that. And facilitate that. And Adam Brody did in his portrayal. Like he only added to the strength of what was being done in those moments. Um, real human moments for the kid. you got to know the story that you are an actor in to properly facilitate that. And not have this look at me kind of thing going on. You've got to tell the story and tell it really well. And he's a big part of that. It's they both the interplay really worked. That moment with Anne when they, when that was happening, and he was she was like tapping into what he was feeling and being inspired by it. And the two of them were rebelling against it. That when Billy came in in that moment and grabbed the dragon from the back, and you had that moment where there was like there was a chuckle and a yeah, you know, you want to like yeah. you, you cheer in the air. Um, it, it meant so much more because of what you saw those two going through emotionally in that moment. That was a way to set up a moment and a scene. Billy then going after the dragon meant that much more. It was taken to 11 and beyond because of, of that. And I really, really loved like just that feel of hoorah, yes! Yeah. Well, and again, to add to that, that dragon sequence, Mm -hmm. You know, and everything you're saying, I'm nodding in my head. Yes, I agree with you. It was wonderful seeing that Freddy gut check, yep. you know, and yep. step up. And then right as the dragon's about to fight, you know, Shazam comes in for the save, you know. And you know, again, 100% agree with you. Then I love the little bit, once again, where he's like, Freddy, and no, getting, you know, uh, Lucy Lou to turn her head. And he snatches the staff out of her. And he snatches the yes. staff out of her has a funny little one-liner about, oh, you fell for that again. But it doesn't take away any of the action. You had those really cool, gripping, physical motion. You had that cool, hoorah, hero moments. You know, and that little, corp, that little funny bit doesn't take away anything from that. That is something that this movie did a brilliant job mm -hmm. in balancing. Those funny little one-liners, those funny little moments, not taking away anything of the seriousness or the power of the statement. It added to you it. Just saw it. Add, yeah, it added to it. And it, that is something that I, one of the things I really loved about this movie was that little factor to it. You know, and it's throughout the movie you have those bits, as I said, as referenced multiple times with superhero Darla and also you know young Darla mm -hmm. had those great moments where they each added a little funny moment into the, the bit that doesn't take away but adds to it. The taste the rainbow kind of thing. Loved seeing in that sequence when you've got the evil unicorns coming at them. You know, Darla tames them with the Skittles. Mary runs over and covers Darla. Mary, who isn't super powered, 
is protecting Darla. That was a great sequence of events going on while Darla is completely believing this is going to work. The unicorns are going to be our friends because of the power of skills, which is a good candy. So, yes, I'd go along with that. But I love the fact that Mary's like, I got to protect Darla, even though knowing she doesn't have any power. So, you see, again, you see the hero step up without powers. That sequence itself, again, wonderful scene. I love that scene. Did they ever say Skittles? Yes. I remember them saying. I remember them saying, "Taste the rainbow." Taste the, and then uh, Mary said, "We're going to need more Skittles." Oh yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They um, so, yeah. They flat out say Skittles. I remember yeah. that. I remember that line. The yeah. second you said it, I'm like, "Oh yeah, yep. he's 100 percent correct." I remember that line. And again, I'm the person who hates product placement in uh, movies. I absolutely hate it. You always, you know, and I get why they do it. You know, you need to make money and sponsors and whatnot. But this one for me worked so well. It was absolutely I, I loved this one. It, it wasn't had, it, it wasn't overdone. No. Was I don't think it was overdone. I loved it. Dietrich Bader as Mr. Geckel. Um really they had they had a lot of guest appearances. Oh, man, poor in guy. There. Um well, that's and I loved in the end I loved in the end credits that they uh took him and, and the guy from the museum and they put them in there, you know, like with angel wings. Um yeah. the end credits, I love their way that they do the end credits. Where they're like notebook art and things, yeah. and, and I really love the way that the end credits are done. It's not something I say very often in a film, but when you are sticking around for a film to watch mid credits and post credits scenes, I really appreciate when some care is put in to making those credits something exciting to watch, and they did a really good job of making those exciting to watch. Yeah. It's it, again. It's I was sitting around for the end credit scenes, you know, because one I didn't know if there was going to be end credit scenes, but again with the Shazam movies, as you said, it's that sketch art. I'm like, oh, these, I like this. This is mm-hmm. cool. I know, uh, and it was something for the first movie, and they continued on the second movie, and I was like, yes, this is neat. Yeah, the 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 tying into Suicide Squad and um, the whole thing with um, Justice Society and all that. It's like I want to know where that was going to go. Well, my guess is we would either get a separate Justice Society movie or Black Adam 2 was going to be just another. But, but you can't have the same Black Adam and Justice Society. That was the first that was the first movie. So they would have to be a separate Justice Society movie. But this time it would be Shazam on the team instead of Black Adam. And in my, okay, here's how my head it plays out. The. The Justice Society movie sets up Shazam number three. Wasn't this supposed to be released first before yeah. Black Adam? Yeah. Would that have been a lead into Black Adam versus the Justice Society, where Shazam wasn't part? Like Shazam says no. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder if that was. Well, I don't. I don't know. I'd be curious to know the history of that particular end credit scene if that was adjusted at all. Or if that was meant to be before? Because I thought this was supposed to be released before Black Adam originally. Originally, this was getting released before Black Adam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wonder if that scene was meant to be a lead-in to Black... I don't know. uh, Black Adam or not. I'm I'm very curious now. I'd like to know more about that end credit scene. Part of me wonders... Okay, so the end of Black Adam where we get Superman to make an appearance. I wonder if that was supposed to be Billy. And they changed it, for whatever reason, to Superman to, to tease his return, and then they cancel that. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. There's a lot of ways you could have talked about like the whole Super... Because here's the thing. Let's say they did Black Adam versus Superman, and that film plays off. Whatever the end result of that encounter goes, you do want to see Billy versus Black Adam. Because it's going to be different, Right. right. Uh, and and impacted by how well Black Adam does against Superman. Or, I'll be honest, here's what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the Black Adam versus Superman plays out in that Superman obviously doesn't beat up uh, Black Adam because Superman just doesn't beat people up. He talks to them, and they'd, have a, they'd initially start off fighting. They'd find out, okay, he's not really pure evil like Amanda Waller's telling me, and he backs off. Then... Shazam is with the surviving members of the JSA. So that's the recruiting process t- is technically takes place after the Black Adam or Superman movie. 
So you think after that teaser, they're going to give us a movie where Superman and Black Adam talk? <laughs> well, not initially. Initially, they're not Wait, but, they, they would be killed. You, know, <laughs> you did that teaser? Like, you imagine like the reviews they get off of that? Yeah. So and, well, they gave us two fun. hours of them having coffee. Yeah, but, <laughs> Be honest, I can stop and think for a second. Oh no, I am th- I am stopping and thinking. I've read Brave and the Bold and um, yeah. stuff for years. They come up with all kinds of crazy reasons why these people should fight. Well, there, there will be an initial fight, and then you know, Superman being Superman, he'll realize, okay, this really isn't right. the threat that Waller said, and then whatever the real threat is, that the two of them will fight together against. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's the, how the movie will play out. <laughs> I'm te- so Waller will Wait, be so mad. I love that you're like feeding this right now because you know I'm teasing you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm having just as much fun as you are because I'm laughing at this. Cause well, you know, because Superman's a talker, and you know they're gonna like like dude. Nobody reads like Superman to like watch him talk. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. We love those moments when Superman like you know gives his one gra on moments and things like that. But those are usually mean something more when he's. Just beating up Dark Side. <laughs> well, I could see, you know, Soup and uh, Black Adam hanging out at the farm. You know, you know, you, you know, Black Adam to try some of Ma Kent's famous uh, apple pie, and you know, hey, it'd be awesome. Come on, it'd be a great scene of just him sitting there. Mm, this is really good. Some tea, you know. Yeah, I'm probably a coffee guy. I think Black Adam's more of a coffee guy than a tea guy. But you know, I think it'd be a neat little moment just them sitting around. You know, it could be the end credit scene. Well, Justice League, here's the thing, it, joking aside, Justice League, Bendis' run, had some really great moments with the two of them interacting. So, I mean, that does work, 100%. I just, I just don't think, that's not going to pull people into the film. Yeah, so, and this is the movie where, like, Superman and Black Adam talk. <laughs> <laughs> without without that catalyst moment where something is pitting them against each other. And even if it's an outside source that's causing that problem, which usually that's what ends up. Well, it's going to be the, it would, it would have been the wall. Right, right. You know, the wall doing something to, you know, make them actually fight, you know, just because she's the wall and that's what she does. Right. You know, and, you know, and again, heroes fight initially, realize they're both heroes, say, okay, let's fight the real bad guy, which I have no idea who that would, what that would be. You know, whether it would be one of uh, Clark's villains or whether, you know, it would be one of uh, Adam's, I don't know. You know, and then Billy joins the JSA. Again, Waller wanting the JSA to fight Black Adam, and but the JSA already knows, hey, he's not the big bad. And maybe then it would be uh, one of the Shazam, maybe this would be the JSA versus the Monster Society. I want him to join the Avengers Society. <laughs> Well, that was awesome. Again, end credit sequence, which, you know, is Shazam, you know, you know, sharpshooting on it, practicing with his lightning bolts, which, again, a total fun thing I would do it. And I could see him doing it with uh, the the recruiters for uh, Waller to join the Justice Society. That for me was this, that whole sequence was absolutely hysterical. We want you to join the Justice, yes, 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 society. Wait, what? Is that the one with Wonder Woman on it? What's your obsession with Wonder Woman? And is what are you saying? What? What do you mean? That was great. Absolutely brilliant. And again, it was one of those things where you know, I wish it would happen. You know, and again, talking the Wonder Woman sequences, we had two great Wonder Woman sequences. First one is the dream sequence where we don't see her face. Until when it's time to actually see her face, it's the wizard. His head pops in warning Billy what's going on. But I loved that secret because I was thinking, oh, okay, they're doing like they did with Superman. They're not showing the face. Oh, that's kind of neat. You know, and a great way for have the wizard come in and warn Billy about the, you know, the sisters attacking and this and whatnot. I thought it was one. I never thought we would actually get a Diane appearance. And at the end of the movie, we actually get a full on Wonder Woman appearance. And I thought that for me, I was like, yes. Again, it's one of those moments when you cheer and then you're like, oh, yeah, they're pulling her as Wonder Woman. So we're not going to get, you know, any more of her. This is the last time we're going to see Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. And I was like, oh, man. Uh, Again, it it was one of those things where you get these really cool moments that are taken away because this universe isn't continuing. 
the actor who played the wizard you mentioned, and I, I'm deliberately not saying his name because I'm going to butcher it. I just know I'm going to. But um, he's terrific. I mean, he was in Gladiator. He was in Amistad. He's just he's a really amazing actor. He really was good not in all the movie. I mean, he's been. We've seen him in Black Adam. We've seen him in Shazam. We've seen him here. Uh, the Wizard's a really important role, but I felt like the progression for the Wizard was really critical here, because there was this idea of he had to make this choice. I mean, even though he'd been searching for years, he had to make the choice of Billy pretty quick. It was it. I mean, there was there was, there was a whole there wasn't a whole lot of evaluation time that he had at that point, <laughs> and he's questioning his choice throughout this film. Just as much as Billy's questioning himself. Through getting to know Billy and getting to know his family and knowing what Billy did selflessly and giving the powers to his family and getting to know Jeff slash Freddy, um, which was, I just thought, fantastic. You know, the yes. fact that he was deliberately messing with him. I mean, yes. it was the personality of the wizard came out so much in this. I liked this idea that, you know, he was, he thought he was dying. This is it. He was going to be done. And he got taken to that world. He was captured into that prison and then thought he'd never be released, gets out and really is now like has this lease on life where I think I'm going to explore your world a little bit, you know, and get to know things. I liked his story arc. Like I wanted to see him in a third film because, you know, here's the thing. There's room for him then to be back. Yeah. I wanted to see him continue to come back and to be this guy. You know, he held onto the staff for a reason because he's intent to um, continue on. But kept them with their powers and uh, all for the reason that he believes in them now. He's all in as a believer. I really enjoyed that whole arc for the wizard. Um, and the moments that he had with Billy were pretty critical. The moments he had with Freddie were pretty critical. You know, they, they had that kind of buddy cop relationship because of escaping together and having to learn to rely on each other that I thought was just really well done. They covered a lot of ground when you think of the amount of character development that happened in all of this between the various heroes, the family, supporting cast, the villains. Um, a lot of ground was covered, and we got to know a lot of people. Even the school bullies, you know, <laughs> you know, like they're, you know, they learned nothing from the first film. Or, no. boy, it does show how, like, your fame is a fickle thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because Freddie had that like like hoorah moment at the end of the last film, and that didn't last very long. No, because um, no. because the, they're right back at their nature. Well, and again, it's just they're bullies. They are who they are, and you know, it's it was a deep little again deep tie back in. And I, again, we get to see that little sequence. We got to see Freddie be Freddie, mm -hmm. and I think that is the the usage of humor, the usage of all that, just who he is. You know, how he, he deflects everything using comedy. And again, it's a classic moment for him. And it was one of those things that really made him and Anne that moment just really endearing. It was it was a great moment between those two. And I love the fact that, you know, she the whole time she's getting ready to just vivisect them because she's got she's a god. And, you know, obviously we didn't know at the time who she was, but those guys were about to get their comeuppance. Freddie saved their life. She was going to kill them without a second thought about it because they deserved it. You know, and I thought that for me was, again, a really neat moment when you kind of realize what how much more of a hero Freddie is that he saved the lives of his bullies. What I thought was really interesting, too, is and this really stuck me, stuck with me. The sense of danger with the staff being able to take away their powers yeah. really was huge because I said a lot that the kids all wanted their powers back afterwards. And and the reason why I say that is, let's use Mary as an example. Mary had her powers taken away mid-flight. Yeah. She was falling to her death. W you know, meaning your powers rely on magic. If that magic, for whatever reason, fizzles, no longer works, you know, you don't know the nature of that. Is it permanent? And clearly what you find out with the staff being able to take it away, it's not. Um, and, you know, is that finite? Well, you have that for the rest of your life. Will that happen? What happened to Mary happened again, having nothing to do with a villain. She was flying in the air and she would have, she was done. I mean, that was it. She was going to splat. Um, if it wasn't for Billy and for the fact that Billy happened to catch there and rescue her, she's still all in at the end. And I, I felt that that was genuine. And I yep. loved that because I think it says something about the character 
that, yes, there's an excitement to having the powers and things like that, but there's also that reality of there's a danger to having them, that they were a very real reality to the danger to them. And I, I really liked that. I also like that sense of whatever age you are, there comes a point in time where you have to be able to branch out and, and become yourself, whoever you are. And sometimes you need to like be away from others to do that. And, and you can come back and re-embrace, you know, and all those pieces. Um, it was funny. You shared a very personal story uh, very early on in this episode about, um, and I was thinking about that timeline. So we're talking early 90s, right? Yeah. Like the conversation you had with your mom, which you and I, it's funny, are we were always friends back then, but you and I didn't hang a lot back then. Like we hung out together. Am I right? I mean, yeah. in our time, I mean, we were, we knew each other from other people and we hung out in like large friendship groups, but we didn't really become like friend friends where like we had this kind of relationship until I'd say like maybe mid nineties. Am I right? Yeah. Kind of um, where we just, I mean, it, really what that is, is for anybody listening, it's we started hanging out you and me and doing things you and me together, which that wasn't something that we had done previously. And I think that's what allowed our friendship to grow more is the fact just really getting to know who we are individually. But um, when you were going through a lot of that, we weren't, I didn't know any of that. And I wouldn't have, I mean, cause we just weren't, you know, at that point, I probably, I was going through some very similar, th- well, I shouldn't say i it's hard to cookie cutter any of that, but I mean, you know, it's, that's, those are, you know, those are years where we got just out of high school trying to figure out who we are, what our path is and things like that. Those are some interesting formative years trying to, you know, kind of craft your way. I was connecting with you when you were sharing all of that. It was, it was an interesting point. And I think it's funny that you're referencing it as we talk about this film where we've got Billy and Mary who are both at that stage and recognizing that their siblings are also going to eventually hit that age and that stage. In their case, they're looking at that might mean that they have to move on. You know, and I think Mary's more well rounded in that. She's not taking it the way that Billy is. Billy's taking it as I gotta cut ties. Um, I gotta, you know, you know, that's it. They've taken care of me till I'm 18 and now I'm a burden. And that I don't think that was totally what Mary was trying to say. Mary was more recognizing I need to be a contributing member of society and a contributing member to this family yeah. where Billy's it like, help the house. Yeah. Right. Whereas Billy's kind of like, I'm a burden and they need me gone. It was, uh, it, it was an interesting sort of different twist off of that. And I can, I think that's normal, right? Where yeah. people based on where they're at maturity wise, how confident they are in themselves, how confident they are in their family, friends, things like that. You're everybody's in, a different place at that time of their life based on circumstance a lot of times and what you've experienced and what you've gone through. And I really liked how honest and real to reality that that all felt. Oh, big time. And it's, again, it goes based also on personal experiences. You looked at how much he's been discarded and how much in his life that the people he's loved just you know, pushed him aside. He's been through multiple homes, multiple, you know, he he finally finds his, his mother after looking for all those years and she basically just pushes him aside again, you know, and it's, you know, and, you know, he finds out that it wasn't an accident. It wasn't got lost. She literally just dumps him and leaves him there and goes away, you know, and it's, you know, his experience, it made, yeah, again, it makes sense why he pushes off that that yep. great sequence in with that doctor's office where he goes to the pediatrist because you know and he needs to talk to somebody. He needs to talk to a shrink, and he goes as Shazam, but he goes to a pediatrist and he's laying out everything that happened to this doctor. And you can just I love how the doctor played it. He's like, "Whoa, this is absurd." You, you know I'm a pediatric, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. Again, not a psychologist, and he, but he, he did. He was a doctor, so he was trying to help him. And I love, but again, how funny that scene was, but also you really do see the seriousness and how much Billy has been put through. We always talk about how Batman is just this, this troubled child, you know, with post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Billy is the same thing dealing with what he's had going on. Only, you know, and only difference is Billy has his family now to ha- kind of help him through. You know, and he's learning from that. Bruce, you know, grew up, you know, and is just now as an adult starting to bring in his family. We're seeing changes in Bruce that, you know, goes along. So it's, it's kind of a neat comparison of just how much childhood trauma these heroes have to become heroes. <laughs> The best part for me, and I was loving all of that, the best part for me was the fact that his justification or his rationalization for that, you know, for the pediatrician was that it was a referral from his friend Billy Batson, who was yeah. one of his patients. Yeah. <laughs> it was so great because it was honest and it was it was him at that age trying to navigate that. And I get it. And it really worked in that sequence. That's one of the things that I really loved about the use of humor in this. The yeah. hu- use of humor in this was very smart. It made for a fun movie. There were awkward moments and things like that that were charming, but yet the heroism was never lost. I, the one piece that I think we really, that we have to talk, well, there's, there's one little piece that I want to talk about super fast and then a big piece that I want to talk about and we can probably wrap up. Pedro's coming out I thought was really cool. And the reason why I thought it was cool, it was this it was this subtle moment where they were telling like they hinted at it earlier in the film when the family was like being honest with each other and opening up about the superhero piece, Pedro was the only one that wasn't in Shazam form. So they were all revealing their truth, like and I'm Billy, I'm Freddy, I'm you know, they're all sharing their pieces. And he's like, and I'm gay. And I love the fact that the family's reaction, which shows the love and respect, was they all knew. They just were waiting for him to hit, come out like when it was right for him. And it was, none of that was like overdone. It was subtle. You just immediately got this family and why they all knew and why they were all handling it the way it was. They all looked at him with like this love and care of like, hey, we knew and we were just letting you have your moment. And and it was almost like for him, it was just kind of like this, oh, cool. You know, and then like moving on moment. I thought that was honest it showed the family and what kind of family they are that he was in that kind of family they just were able to accept him they knew who he was already they were that in touch with each other that like that was not a big reveal and they just moved like you're like dude you're still pedro like we know like you know it's, it's a thing i thought that was i thought that was really well handled and they didn't over dialogue it because there's something to be said about knowing the characters so well and the actors being able to portray that emotion, that support, in a way where you don't need to go in through this really long exposition. As the viewer, you are feeling what's going on with them and then you just move along. And there's something interesting about that that was, I just thought, a different way of handling that kind of thing in the film. Here's the thing with that sequence, Bill. Um, I almost spoke, I spoke to you, Bill. Sorry about that, John. <laughs> Listen, about- we'll do a few more of these, and we'll get to know each other better. It'll- <laughs> <laughs> well, I think of you like a brother, and my brother's name is Bill. <laughs> That was now. That was a heck of a recovery. Because <laughs> like, because like, here's the thing. Right now, I, I, I can't really have a smart ass comment to that, can I? Because <laughs> that was incredibly kind and mutual. So, <laughs> here's the thing about that scene. That happened right as I was. Um, you had to run to the bathroom. I was right as they were running through, and they're in the parents' house, and they're like, you know, hey, oh, did you not see that? What? You did not see that? I did not see it. I heard it because I was literally okay. running out of the theater and I heard Pedro say, and I'm gay. And then I heard the others say, you know, and I heard uh, 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 Billy, you know, Shazam say, oh, no, we know it's cool, bro. You know, and I, so I heard that. I didn't get to see any of that stuff. So, so for that, that was pretty on, much. And wait, dude, what you're describing right now was pretty much it. I mean, there was like a, a few seconds more after that, but it was really more of an emotional reaction of the acting talent. That yeah, so I didn't see any of that. It was kind of like a dude. We know we got you. Like you know, and and I mean, it was that simple, and it was one of those moments where it defined the family. If it makes sense, like 
it was we're in this we're in a like this weird era right now where there's all this conspiracy anytime something is thrown in that's more representative of today. I thought what that moment did and why I thought it was really important for this film is it it defined this family. It was another area where they defined the relationship and understanding of this family. It was subtle. It was quick. It's who Pedro is. They teased it earlier on. The family just all knew. And they were like, it was, it was kind of like, I don't want, I want to, I don't want to say so what, but it was more kind of a dude, we know. And we got you. And that was like, you know, it was just done in like such a cool way. And then they moved along and it fit because it, it also was humorous, you know, because everyone else is like shouting out that they're superheroes. And he's like, well, this is my moment. And boom, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like this weight was lifted off of him. It was just neat. It was like all of them had just kind of unleashed everything right there. And it just really fit that moment. I just I appreciated the writing of that. And just how quick it was. Because it didn't need to be more. It was more emotional in the way that they did it. There's choices that are made sometimes where you're like, you could have really over overdone this and lost the emotion. And it was sometimes subtle gives you more. It lets you feel it. Lets you experience it with them. And that was kind of neat. You didn't need to over explain that. Yeah, and, and it's funny because I that's when I left the theater. So I heard the initial song, and I got back just as uh, Lu- the, well, the Kalisto, <laughs> Lucy Liu was playing her dragon, taking away the powers, and just after she got Mary's powers. So got I it. got to see Mary free falling, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, Shazam saving her, and I got to see that great sequence with the wizard on the uh, on the the, the uh, car deck, you know, on the parking lot, and I got to see all that neat stuff that happened, you know. So it was a cool, you know. I missed that whole that obviously probably was a really neat fight sequence, but I did get back in time for like the cool story, you know, feely stuff, the, the emotional aspect of it. So I did I miss a good chunk of the I missed the a good action sequence, but yeah. Oh, well, the resolution of the film was where we start to see the wisdom of Solomon start to enact, right? Yes. Because yes. Billy's recognizing that the staff is like acting like a battery. It's absorbing yeah. things. It's taking in the power and like any battery can be overloaded, you know, and he's banking on that. Like I can overload this thing. So he's talking to Hesper about this. And I love that he's like bringing her back, you know, like using the powers, you know, clear, <laughs> was, which I thought was really great. Helen Mirren, and I mean, this is, I mean, she's such a great actress. He's having this moment with Helen Mirren, and she's basically pointing out, well, if you do that, it will blow up everything in the bubble. The second he said to her, and sometimes this is where it's okay to over, to bring us in as fans. Let us feel like we understand the character and we know the plan. He didn't tell us the plan, but I knew there what this plan was. Yeah. He's like, then I've got to ask you a favor. And I'm like, oh, dude is going to sacrifice himself because there's no other choice. And But he's going to protect his family and everyone else in the process. I knew he was going to somehow get her to either get them out of the dome or shrink the dome. I didn't know which. But I, I felt like the, the plan here was everyone needs to be outside the dome that could be ten- potentially hurt. Yeah. And I loved how that was played out. The sequence where he's battling and you see him, he, he goes at her multiple times with the staff in hand. And he's doing it for the purpose of absorbing as much as he can without getting fried himself. You know, because he knows he has, he has to be around long enough for the end game which is to say Shazam at the right time. And I love that. I'm like, I know where this is going. And what's going to happen is now you've got Billy Batson with no protection in the middle of all this. Yep. And I loved how that played out, that sense of I am going to do this. He has that moment with his family, with Freddie, and you just, everything's like full circle. He is, he's like, I've got to let them know how they, what they mean to me. I need to let them know I know what I'm doing, um, that this is, this is the right thing. You know, he, he has that heroic moment and it was, and I love that the second that dome was down, the family was doing what they needed to get in there. We need to find you, you know, find him. And, you know, it's, it's this desperation. Where is Billy? 
it was just such a great ending of a battle, ending of a uh, of sequence with a villain. I was hoping that the film was going to have her. Like, I was hoping there wasn't going to be a cliffhanger because of the fact that I was pretty sure this was going, that there was not going to be a third. Yeah. Um, and I hate saying that because I loved this film so much. But um, I also, I, I, I'm jumping to something that I don't want to be so erratic with this, but I did like the cat's name was Tawny, yes. <laughs> I, I, which is a great Shazam reference. But the ending of this, having this kind of, with Wonder Woman and everything that happened and their use of Wonder Woman as a god to reignite the staff, I like that I knew where it was going when I saw her. Um, and I, I like that there was the resolution in this film because if this is it, if this really is going to be you know the last of them, I'm so glad I got these two movies. And I'm glad that this one wrapped up the way that it did. Uh, I want the payoffs for the two things that happened in the end credits, but if I don't get them, I got these movies, yeah. and and that really mattered to me. Well, here's the thing with me and the ending. Now, again, when he when he's like, I got one more favor. As soon as the bubble started shrinking, I knew exactly what he was going to do: shrink it down to the stadium, mm -hmm. and then blow it up inside the stadium, taking them out. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent saw that coming. Love those sequences with him and his family, and even Freddie's like, it's all or none. It's all it's all or none. It's like, yeah, all of my family is going to be safe. And I love just those moments, and even that little, hey, I'm, you know, I'm Captain Every Power Junior. You know, just that little nod back to Freddie, and you know, how Freddie was telling, oh, that's my sidekick, Captain Every Power Junior. You know, again, little funny moment takes it back and makes it a serious, really cool brother moment. Yeah. I love that stuff, and. 100% saw that coming with the, they were going to bury him in the God's realm because even Helen Mirren said, you know, when right as she was dying, he's a true God. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So I was thinking in my head, what I thought was going to happen, they bury him and he rejuvenates the tree of life. Mm. That's how I thought it was going to go. And then when I heard the music, da -da 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 -da, the Wonder Woman music, like, oh no, oh, that is awesome. She grabs it, she re sparks it. As soon as she put it in the ground, I knew he was coming back. I knew that was happening. And I love the fact that when he started coming back, Eugene's first reaction was, zombie! Because, <laughs> you know? again, yes, that would be his reaction. It completely fit him. It was a great, funny moment, but didn't take away from the seriousness that, you know, Shazam is coming back. That he didn't, Billy didn't die. He was rejuvenated by the tree of life in the God realm. So that, again, says all of the gods are going to come back eventually. So we we could have a chance to have in Helen Mirren, have Lucy Liu come back. We can have all of the gods come back because the gods realm, the god realm is being reborn. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I think that for me is something that was like, this is like an epic. And you get the great moment between, you know, Shazam and Wonder Woman where, again, he's a goofy kid, you know, hitting on this incredibly hot woman, you know, and she's very nice to him, you know, you know. Just stick with saving the world, kid, you know, you know, because she's one of one is constantly hit on. She knows how to handle it, you know, and she handles it nicely. And, you know, because that's just how we've seen her do it again. Wonderful usage of the characters. I would have lo I, again, I would love to see the next movie. Yeah. Not even just because of you know, potential interaction there, but just to see where, you know, Shazam goes, where the God realm goes. You get that great ending sequence with Anne and Freddie really are connected. You know, and I, I'd like to see that little relationship blossom. You know, it's there's so many different things they could do with continuing the Shazam universe. They don't need to tie it in to anything else. They could continue running this universe without tying into anything else if they wanted to. You know, and, and I think there is. Or here's, they here's the thing: use this to keep Wonder Woman, keep Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, keep you know Henry Cavill as Superman. You know, they could make this part of that old universe. This could be the way they keep the old universe together. I don't know. Here's, here's I, here's I would the, love to see it. Here's the problem. Dollars yeah. drive all this. Yeah. How this movie does overall is pretty critical. I know when I checked as of yesterday, the first couple of days, which are Thursday and Friday, which I don't know how St. Patrick's Day and the Thursday play into it. Could there be a resurgence this weekend? I hope so. Um, I didn't. I haven't looked yet to see if we have Saturday numbers. Um, all I know is my theater was very well attended. 
Now, I don't know that it was, was it well attended for Shazam? I don't know. I went to Great Lakes Mall by us, you know, mm-hmm. and um, it, it, the parking lot was full, um, which is, lately has not been the case. Like, we had to actually park, they have a parking lot that's surrounding the actual um, movie theater. We had to park outside of that parking lot. Which to me is always, and I can't remember the last time I had to do that. That to me is a good sign that there's some movie going going on. And now there's a there's a few movies that are running right now that people are going to see. You know, Creed, for example, being one of them. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see what this weekend's box office looks like and what's really the draw. Um, I'm hoping that you know, I'm hoping at the very least that we see some numbers for all the movies that were out. You know, the big ones that were out right now. Um, you know, the ones that people are noticing. Because it's a good sign for just movie going in general. This film not doing well is not a good thing. If it, it does is. not. I mean, it, just in the sense for choice. Because I think right now we're still getting... The, we're in this weird time where people are trying to navigate streaming versus going to the theater. There is, like, usually singleton movies that are either drawing people in or they're not. A lot of that, I do believe, is being driven by the internet and media in the sense that the reaction as far as whether or not you should see something is being driven by that. Um, There's been some surprises, sure, Um, but a lot of that is being driven, and it's an an interesting time. So I'm I'm hoping this, because the film's good. You know, is it for everybody? No, but what is? Uh, You know, I mean, there's not, not every film is for everybody. Uh, but this one was a very, very entertaining late winter, early spring film. And exactly exactly what I was looking for from it. And and so much of what I didn't know I was looking for. Yeah, right now, looking at news articles, mm-hmm. and Shazam 2 is the worst um, opening uh, weekend so far of any DC movie. Yeah. Which is not good. No. Because... Again, there's no way there will be a third movie if this doesn't do gangbusters. You know, for me, I absolutely love this movie. So I thought this was a great movie, 100% worth going seeing. It's it's a fun movie. It's a good movie. It continues on the story. You know, and again, it there were, as I said earlier, there, there were times where I, I got upset and sad because I knew there weren't plans to keep this thing going. But if you look beyond that, if you just look at the movie itself, this is a wonderful movie. You know, it goes through all of the emotions. It tugs at your heartstrings. It gives you some great hero moments. It gives you some funny moments that doesn't take away from it. And you get some solid, solid acting. You get some really believable portrayals that these characters are giving in a superhero movie. You know, again, we're, we're, the the actors nowadays aren't looking this as just a superhero movie. Right. This isn't Sharknado where they're like, ah, I'll learn my lines the day of shooting. This is an actual true movie. These are true actors who are throwing it out there. So it's it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Anything else we left out in the film that you wanted to discuss? No, no, no. Well, <laughs> that bridge sequence with the kitties again, you know, Super Darla had those moments. <laughs> You know, and again, the Fast and the Furious tie-ins that you see in the um, you see it in the trailer, so it's not a, it wasn't a surprise where you know it, where Shazam and you know Hespera are having their thing. He's like, but I've seen all the Fast and Furious movies. It's all about family. That's the clue, guys. Come on, and then they arrive again. That's a great sequence, but that interaction between them was absolutely brilliant. And I, and again. You could say she was the you know, the strong scene on it because again, this that that menacingness and this, just how she really explains what she's doing. Yeah, she's a villain, but she's really not. She was wrong, and she's just seeking justice. And I, but again, I love just that back and forth between them. You know, because even 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 when he has those little moments, like, hey, you're really scary. I'm not going to lie to you. You're really scary. You know? And he has that great just interaction. You really see the child in him going up against just really dangerous person. You know, that, again, it, it really does showcase what you can do with, um, with these characters, what you can do with this, this, genre of char- this genre of movie 
can really have some really cool moments. And and also Steve. I want Steve. You know the pen? <laughs> I want the Steve the pen. Like what you named him Steve? Yeah, he looked like a Steve. <laughs> The best is the confidence in it that, like, we don't need to proofread this because, you know, I mean, it's Steve. I mean, Steve's yeah, going to – Steve knows what he's doing. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, Steve's writing every single thing. Yeah. <laughs> that letter, you know, that he sent was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, it was like, you know, the outers of Atlas, the outers of Atlas, you know, we've got this. And it, it just – and then, okay, what do we want to say next, guys? Yeah, what it's all being written down. And just – Helen Mirren played that so perfectly because she's reading it straight face. It's like, what is this Gatorade? Is it a weapon? <laughs> That was that was so, Lucy Liu was great in that sequence too because the Gator, Gatorade when to play was actually between the two of them. I think Lucy yeah. Liu was actually the one trying to find Gatorade. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it was, uh, and again, to your point, they've got to play that straight. Otherwise, it's not funny. Yes, and they did they did a really great job of playing that off. <laughs> There's so much to love about this film. I pre-ordered it like right away last night. Like yeah. I, I went on uh, iTunes and I'm like, is this thing available for pre-order? I want to own this. Um, I'm excited to own it. I would, um, I'd like to go see it again in the theater actually one more time before it uh, leaves the theater just because this was one with the action sequences, the dragon, um, you know, all the creatures and um, effects that were in there, the dome and everything, the sense of scale and scope plays out so well on the big screen with that music and that experience. You know, there's, I can't replicate that at home. Uh, I, I mean, this will look great on my TV at home, yeah. but there's something to that experience. This was a movie that needs to be seen in the theater. Yeah. Oh, great. I agree completely. It's, again... Highly recommend it to anybody if you're like, ah, I don't know, go see it. Because seriously, and if you're like, I didn't really like the first movie too much, well, guess what? This is actually a better movie. I flat out mm -hmm. will say Shazam 2 beat Shazam 1 for me. Yeah, I wasn't, were you expecting that? I was not. No, not at all. I've never had it really where sequels I thought were better. Yeah. I thought sequels were just as good. You know, I've had a couple movies where I'm like, oh, that sequel is just as good as the original. That's nice. I'm glad they did it. I've never had it where I said, you know what? I like the second one better than the first one. Yeah. Yeah, I'll wrap up with this. I'll say it again. I was expecting to have the con I was really fully expecting this conversation where we're talking about a good movie and why it's okay to, for it to be a good movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, 100%. I was like, okay. And again, going into the movie, going driving to the movie in the car, I was practicing some of the stuff I was going to say. Because you know? this, I was literally expecting. Oh, hey, it was a fun movie. It was a solid B. You know, I don't think it was going to be like that. You know, no, this is a solid A for me. You know, yeah. This it's averaging like six or seven out of ten, depending on yeah. where you're looking at it, and and the reviews. And they're not. They didn't see the same movie I did. Like it's seventy one percent on Metacritic. It's ninety percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and seven. Oh, that's just an I'm sorry. I'm looking at the first one. Um, yeah. Ignore what. Ignore everything I just said about those numbers. I think it's like fifties. Yeah, which it shouldn't be. It should be a lot higher. It, again, this was a much better movie, and I think part of people's, I think part of people' reaction to it are the fact that either they know there's not going to be a third movie, yeah, or they're just the the haters. Because yeah, it's no, it's fifty. You're right. It's fifty three percent on Rotten Tomatoes. And I don't normally look at I don't normally look at this, but here's the difference: the audience score is eighty seven percent. Yeah, and that's a thousand plus verified ratings. So it's one hundred and seventy three reviews on the Tomato Meter, and that's fifty three percent. So the critics are in a very different place than the audience. Um, it says something when there's that disparity. Um, I'm glad that they put an audience score on there because I think there is a difference. I think you know sometimes what critics look for. And that's not, I mean, critics are critics. Um, it's, it's one of the, wow, that's, it's an, that's an interesting disparity between uh, critics and audience reviews. We are crystal men from Mercury. We have no quarrel with you. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's one 388 4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. RagingBullets at gmail.com is our show email address. If you prefer to contact us that way. RagingBullets.com is our show website. That's when we release our episodes, where we post them immediately. That feeds into Twitter. 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 <laughs> My it also, if, if there is a Twitter out there, we'll, we'll be happy to be a part of that too. But it feeds into Twitter. 
It feeds into our Facebook fan page. We are proud to be part of an amazing Facebook group community. And that's where I go to find all my news, to be honest. It's one of the first spots that I go to. Uh, The team that's over there really does a great job of curating not only news, but great artwork, great blogs, links to podcasts, anything. It's really a true community. So um, please, if you haven't joined it, please consider joining it and participating over there. And I really appreciate everyone over there. They're such an important, integral part of this podcast. The About Us section of the show website is where you can find out details on how to connect with us, whether it's social media or gaming platforms, and I update that pretty regularly, so uh, please make sure to check that out and connect with us the ways that are important to you. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Mr. Segulin, what's going on over at DCBService.com? We have Shazam issue number one, 40% off, only two thirty nine. dollars We have Peacemaker Try Hard issue one of six, 40%, two ninety nine. dollars And we have a great Christmas present in Sandman Morpheus, the Helm box set, only 45%, only uh, two seventy five. dollars So thank you, DCBS. Once again, at InStockTrades.com, they have some real cool top sellers. Young Animals, Doom Patrol by Gerard Way and Nick Darrington, $49.99 regularly, 42% off, only $28.99. And Batman Superman World's Finest, The Devil, Neza. That one is $24.99 regularly, 42% off, only $14.49. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Our next episode, Jim, we're going to be back and we're actually going to talk about that Shazam! Fury of the Gods special that was recently released, where a lot of the stories were written by cast members from the film, and we're also done in partnership with some great comic talent. We're also going to talk about, and coincidentally so, Riddler Year One, which is written by Paul Dano, who played Riddler in the film. So it's going to be a fun episode. We will see everyone next week. Bye. All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I sure we are. Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Jim! Okay. Raging bullets, time is here. We talk about what we hold dear. Comic books and TV shows. Superheroes and their clothes. Just as sleek and so much more. Okay, fellas, get ready. That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim. Jim. Jim! Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, no, that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't. I didn't mean to buy that. I think it's going to be my song. 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 I think it's going to be my song.